I don't have a Bible up here, but when you turn the Bible up, like it's speckled. Amen. By the way, Sister June is going to come and minister for us that day. Amen. Catch up with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We're singing for Brother Aaron today.
shall forget the day. That's right. Amen, amen. You know, I had many days. I remember the night we had it uh, at uh, Sprayberry High School out in Cobb County. Uh, Rex Humbard was out there on the way up in the Used to watch him on television. He had a lot to do with me moving on in the Lord. I was in the Presbyterian Church. <laughs> But anyhow, we was out there, and my whole family, all five of us, went down and, and they dedicated ourselves, we dedicated ourselves to the family that night. Yeah. Hell, that's, um, that's try number 3223 in the red book. We in G.
Amen. 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 So you look into his word, don't you? That'd be a good thing for us to do. If you'd like turning your scriptures and follow along, we will uh, not use Ephesians today, and we'll pick back up in it as we go along to express each verse kind of. But let's go over to the book of Job. Job 7. We'll just read a few verses there. Good to see everybody in the house of the Lord. Remember now, Bible study is coming Saturday, 6 o'clock. And then remember, on the 10th of April, Brother Claude Weisinger will be here with us uh, preaching for the weekend, so remember that. And remember, uh, Sister Trudy is leaving out Thursday, so, you know, to go, what is it, Trinidad? She's leaving Thursday, so just pray for her that the Lord would give her a safe trip and everything, you know, and all the flying and stuff like that. So just remember that, okay? Any other announcements? I generally forget them. But maybe that's all. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for the day and the hour, Lord, that we have. Thank you for all things because you said you give them to us freely. So we thank you. We praise your great name and we just ask you to be with us now as we endeavor to speak about you and that, Lord, that we may see you and just walk in the light of your love. Forgive our sins because that's the one thing that we desire is to be cleansed and walk in you. And have your way now and keep us, Lord. Let our thoughts and our meditations be set up on thee. We, we need you because you're the one that would be all of the, the, the things that we have need of is all in you. So then all we need is to get you in us. Just have your way now and keep us in Jesus' name. Job 7, we just read verse 17 and 18. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him, and that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment? You may be seated. The Lord had his blessing to the reading of the word. Now we're still in. Ephesians and talking about predestination and we'll get back to some of the things but I just wanted to uh, we've been so much trying to preach in eternity of going you know so far and then eternity going so far back and if you can't go just as far back with eternity as you can forward then you don't understand what eternity is so you know but we're going to get down into that and probably uh, the next service will be on uh, still in the, the Ephesians to, you know, predestinated in him and, and things like that to just kind of cover individually uh, some of the things that are said. But I just got a thought there, thinking a little bit last night, you know, how to approach. And uh, I thought, well, what we need to do is just really just think about, you know, where we are and what we're doing and really what we are. Amen. And I, I just got that thought, you know, from the scripture. We'll get on over in a minute into Hebrews, but you know, uh, Job, he was a pretty smart man, right. Right. and right. counted in the day as be the smartest of all. And uh, so he asked that question: What is man that thou shouldest magnify him? And thou should have set thine heart upon him. Now we take that and we'll go, we'll get over it in a minute in the book of Hebrews, okay? And Psalms to pick up the others. But uh, I want you to think on it because I wrote in my Bible many years ago there in Hebrews 2, uh, you know, where it's talking about what is man that art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him. And I wrote there, I wrote bride and son of man. You know, because that's what I want you to think about. Right. See, we, we take it as being just, you know, when it says, what is man? We take it as being just the son of man. See, because we take that as we'll read it and, and all. Let's just go there and read that one where we'll have it in our, our thoughts. Go to Hebrews 6 and, uh, you know, Hebrews 2, 6. And uh, just, just think on a little something. Because that's what I want to get a point across. In other words, what are you? 
You ever thought about what you are? Well, what do you mean? I'm me. You know, I'm a human being. But have you ever thought about it? Just really thought about it. So think on this verse six, Hebrews two, verse six. But one in a certain place testified, saying, "What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him?" All right. See, thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. But in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that's not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, okay? So when you really, you know, when people, you say, well, what, the scripture, what is man? And your mind will automatically go over to thinking about the son of man. But I don't want you to do that. I want you to think about the question is not asked of who is the son of man, because God knew who that was. You know, or what is the son of man? The question is, what is man? You know, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Well, see, back over then in Job, see, he didn't list anything there about the son of man. Right? See, he just said, what is man that thou, that thou shouldest magnify him? You know, honor and glory and things to be brought to him. Yeah. All right? Then he's asking us the question, do you know who you are? What is man? Why would God be concerned about man? What would be the, the point that he would even be any thoughts concerned? Drop over a couple of, of scriptures in, in the 15th chapter. And, uh, you know, 15th chapter and the 14th verse. What is man that thou should, that he should be clean? So now we know that that's not talking about the son of man, and he which is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. Why would God be concerned about man? That's my point. What is it so great about man that would cause God to consider or ask the question? What is man? All right, go over in Psalms. Psalms 8. This is the one where it's picked up from Hebrews, but it doesn't carry all the way. You remember, and Paul picks it up a little higher. He right. said, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower, and you know, crowned him with glory and honor, and madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Now, I thought we believed that man in his original condition or existence or thought, you know, as a spiritual man, that that spiritual man was placed over the garden. That he could rule the animals, you know, like the Holy Spirit does. Because he was in that form. Now we'll get to that in the next message or so. But the point I'm wanting you to think about now is just think about yourself. Right. What is that good about man? I mean, are we so wonderful? <laughs> really, I, I'm wondering about it because that was the thought. That what is man? Why would God not be uh, just as concerned or thoughtful about the animals. When they're under his control and they can, you know, a storm can be coming and they're so under his control until they'll leave the place, get out of the rocks because of the earthquakes. They'll, they can be led and man had to be driven into the ark Right? I mean, sure he was told to build an ark, but he basically had to be made go into the ark. Yep. But the animals travel from all over the world. It took 120 years to, 
to build a, the ark. Well, it probably took God 120 years to get all the animals to travel. You know, the distance he had to get them to travel because you didn't have no boats back then to run over and pick them up and bring them over for you, you know. It, uh, but I got thinking about that one time and I was looking at it, you know, and seeing how long it would take, say, for an elephant to, to leave Africa and keep migrating and keep migrating and keep migrating and then you wind up with two of them there you know, to, to get in the ark. But yet my point is God could lead them. And He can lead the animals. It looks like He'd be more satisfied with the animals than He is with anything, you know, of us. But, you know, what really makes God so mindful, and Brother Theo Erasmus, if you remember him, always liked him as a good brother, you know, and he always had little catchphrases and things and and kind of my brother Ernie, Bill and Wavy, you know, he had his own little way of saying it. And he said, he preached on that one time, you know, what is man that art mindful of him? And he said, see there? He said, God's mind is just full of us. He said, it's just full of us. Because he's mindful. So his mind is just packed full. Well, why? What's, what is so great about man that would make God the creator of all the universe, but yet he would bottle himself, or whatever would be the word for it, right. to come down to earth, make all of the things, and Brother Brown said he knew that some of us would like mountains, and said he created mountains. He said he knew some would like plains, flatlands, some would like this, some would like the ocean, some would like this, you know, mountainous ranges, whatever. And he said, he made all of that for us. You know? He put everything there for you and I. And we wound up being the last creation you know, in the chain of creating. I told you we're going to go back and start this our earthly journey now and travel along a little bit in it on predestination where we can see it. But He made you and I the last one. Right. Now, what did, why did He Bring everything down to where you and I are at. You know, oh, I know we think we're pretty. You know, we think we're this. We think we're all kind of things. You know, we think we're so great until that. No, what? What is the point? Why would Job ask the question two times? The psalmist asked the question, and then Paul asked the question. What is man? And each time that I said, we want to just go on over to the Son of Man, but each time it's asking a question about man. And telling though that man is to be over everything, to rule over everything. But why? What's the, what's the point? Why would he not be as concerned with the animal life? To say what is a monkey? You know, what is this or what is that? But no, it's what is man? So there must be something about man that is coming down into the highest chain of creation that would bring that man to a place that God was pleased. All right. So you'll find it in Genesis that he was pleased to the first day, yeah. you know, second day, third day, etc. He was pleased at his creation. Right. But he made us the last, coming in on the sixth day and being man. See? And as he did, what made him so concerned that he would tie up the entire world 
to try to get an answer to you and I? No. Would not that be the summation of the entire Bible that God had always tried to contact man? Right. You look down through the Old Testament and you see the things happening. You see men that would be like Moses that would, you know, come so close to God until that he would actually be speaking, you know, and God, you know, they just have to cover his face because he'd been in the presence of God. And he was pleased with man, even though a fallen estate. He didn't destroy us when we sinned. You say, well, he was just looking at the atonement with us. I'm glad of that, whatever he was looking at. But the point is, he didn't destroy us. Is it that he loves us sinful? No, no. That's beside the point. But maybe it's in our creation. Because if we're the last in the creation, then maybe it's in that creation. So we know that there in Genesis, and we'll get back to that as the spiritual part later, but I want you to hold it just to nay, just think. I'm just you know, I'm just going to just talk to you about it and just, it's something that's on my heart and you listen. But you know, God is a triune being. Right. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Right? And when He created man, He created a triune being. A body, spirit, so, you know. And he created us in his image. Now, if you don't like the word image there in Genesis for the natural man, just say likeness to him because it does have image and likeness, you know. So if you don't like image too much, just use the word likeness and forgive my, my inability to understand. But my point is, man even in his fallen estate He's still in the image of God. Right. Amen. Even in the fallen estate. Yep. None of the animals, sure, and I know they can progressively train them to do things, etc. Yeah. But still, they've never been able to train a bird how to build its nest right. any different. Right. It may have had to adapt to the position it built it in, that instead of building it in a tree, it builds it in the corner of your house or somewhere where it can find a hole, but you know, it still just builds that nest. And everything's the same. Right. But man is constantly changing. I'm 70 years old, and in my lifetime, we have went from a horse and buggy, you know, to an astronaut. Right. Right. In our lifetime. The advancement of science, you know, to where that we we're, it's just almost uh, unthinkable about the things that man can do. You're sitting with a a little cell phone in your pocket there, and those things are a computer. You know, I mean, you know. It can do everything that the big laptop computer can do and contact things and do everything. Just, you know, it was created by man. Right. Even medical science. Yeah. We throw off on a lot of the things, but even in medical science, you know, that's what I was telling Brother Dean the other day. I said, when they, they said that, that that aneurysm, remember how you pronounce it, big old word, that was there, I said, when they said that it was what was causing the trouble, I said, well, thank God that it made your eye to start hurting. <coughs> because had it not, it may have just blowed out and killed you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Ever how they found Brother Danny's there and operated, see? Thank God for that. I mean, back when we was kids, you didn't have anything, you know, to be able to... Uh, 
You couldn't go to the doctor, and if he did, he didn't know what to do. We had our own home, home remedies, and, and those were just about as good as anything because if you got the coughing, they would just take some some uh, kerosene and and a little sugar and or something like that, coal oil, and, and they put that sugar on that kerosene or kerosene on the sugar, and you'd be crouping like everything and coughing. Well, once you got that and put it in your mouth, you didn't cough no more. It may have been self-control that kept you from coughing, but you just didn't cough anymore because it would just clean out everything. Well, now, we don't do that today, you know. We, we take a cough drop or we take a, go get some, some kind of medicine from for it. But you see how that we've advanced. Because it says in Genesis that, that nothing is withholding from the imagination of man. And we really are in the day that you can see that. That now, it's never been that instantly around the world, you know, I mean, you can talk on the telephone. You know, we was in Israel and then he woke up and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm calling them at the church. It's uh, six or nine hours different. Anyhow, I calculated the time and she said, what time is it here? I said, three in the morning. What are you calling them at three in the morning for? I said, it's not three in the morning there. Well, see, that was good. But now it's a whole lot more instant than that. Everything is just so great until it's it's almost, you know, beyond the thinking of man's mind. And the reason that he can do that is because he's a little creator. He's a little creator. He can take things and work it out. I've always said to you, you could destroy right now the uh, the things it took, no telling, it probably took, for the first 2,000 years, it probably took a 1,000 years for them to develop a way to, to temper metal and things or do things. Right. But you see, even what knowledge was brought over the ark in just, you know, Noah and his children, you know, it wasn't just a little while they were tempering metal again. Right. Well, because they had the knowledge of it. And look what it'd be now if you just wiped out everything. But left just a few people with a little knowledge, you can bring it right back. Why? Because we're little creators. Right. That's right. And see, that's what God likes about us. He likes the part about us of being the word that we're in His image. Like I said, even in our fallen state, Sure, if we hadn't failed, we wouldn't need all of this. But in our fallen estate, they just constantly coming up with some way of doing something better. We're building houses better. We're building cars better. We're we're doing all kind of things a whole lot better than we used to be because they were little creators. Well, see, God then is pleased to dwell with us. Now, I mean, I'm carnal, I know, and sorry, but you know, I think God would be more, have more enjoyment sitting down and talking to Einstein about his theories than he would me because I don't know anything about him. You know, you understand what I'm trying to get across? That there's something about you and I that makes God want to dwell with us. We'd say, well, He created us for worship. Well, that's true. But He dwells with us when we don't even worship Him. Right? So what is man? He's created in the image of His Maker. And I keep saying that even in the fallen estate, that man is still 
It's, it's just unthinkable about the, right. the ability of mankind. Right. And if that be true, then there must be something there that he likes. So, what is it that would make him like us so much? Yep. It's because we're created in his image. Right. That's it. He's a triune being. I'm not a trinity, a triune being. And you and I are a triune being. And see, you know how that I preach it. I believe Almighty God is real. I don't believe in and just think about him as being some kind of a, a mythologies or myths or thoughts. I believe he's real. I believe he's more tangible than we're tangible. Right. 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 But see, he's, he's asked the question, do you know who, what you are? Well, yeah, I know I'm made in the image of a maker, but, but what image? Hmm? See, this is where most people don't even want to go that far about it because they want to say God is a spirit. And no, no, I believe God is real. Amen. You want to know what I think God looks like? I think He looks like you. Mm -hmm. yep. I think Jesus was the proof of that. Yes. That He was Almighty God made into human flesh. Hmm. But do we really know who we are and what we're doing? You know, we were brought here for a purpose. Is it just to worship? That's what people deal with, you know. We're brought here to worship God. We're brought here. Well, no. We're brought here for rulership. Right. We'll get to more of that on adoptions and things. But we're brought here to rule the world. Right. Amen. Sure, look what a garbage can we've made out of it. Right. 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 But that's still beside the point that He brought us here for that purpose. Amen. That's what the psalmist said. That's what the Job said. Everything was to be under our dominion. And even in your fallen estate, there's very, very few animals that are not fully under our subjection as far as leadership. And they can even be brought to that. Yeah, right. yeah. They've trained almost every animal and form in the world from bears to whales to you know right. mankind has been able to take over and, and, and train them hmm? huh? so it means there's something about you that those animals are That's right. under your subjection That's why they tell you if a bear is attacking you, stand up as high as you can, holler at him. Scream at him. You take a dog, ask any of these. You take a dog that's coming at you, speak to him in a stern voice. Don't, hi, that dog, don't even scare you. Don't get out of here. No. Right. To get out of here and leave me alone. The sterner the voice, the quicker they'll mind you. Why? Because there's something about you. He was made to be under your subjection. And even in your fallen estate, He's under your subjection. That's right. yep. The Bible says, you know, that we put, uh, what is it, bridles in the horse's mouth and the things. We've been able to train, as I said, almost every animal in the world in some way or another at one time has been able to be conquered of mankind. Because he's their master. 
And Brother Branham, I'll give you a quote later about it, but he said there where it said, let us make man, he said that was God talking to the animals, you know, how he was going to make the man. In other words, he's going to make him a ruler over them. Right. And even though we're, you know, even though it's a fallen estate, it's still that rule factor is there. So what is man? <coughs> All right, so then if we're a trying being, we need to understand about that a little. We can spend a lot of time talking about things, but you know, we need to understand. See? See, we only, as I said, we take where it says what is man, and we just leave that alone. We don't want to fool with that. But then when it comes, you know, the rest of, and the son of man. See, we emphasize that, but the emphasis is upon the question that was to start with. What is man? Right. See, being a triune being then, to be body, spirit, and soul, then we deal with God or should deal with God as a triune being. But when we say triune being of God, what do we say? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Right? Hmm. See, we, we just put it on that basis. But why can't we look farther back and see that Almighty God is more real than we are? Right, man. Right. You mean he was just floating around up there as a glob? You know, just... Why can't we think of him being body, spirit, and soul? That's right. Amen. Right. Yes, sir. Amen. Why can't we think of him as being real? Right. Right. Amen. That's right. Because he made man real. Right? right? Gave us dominion, gave us all the things. Right. And I keep saying, even in our fallen estate, that image is still there. Right. That we're, we're a little creator. And God likes that. Right. Why? Because He brought into being, He could fellowship with the animals and lead them, sure. But He brought into being a man that he could fellowship with. Right. Amen. See, we take it as fellowship on the basis that, that he created us for fellowship. Well, why not take it the basis that he created us for fellowship right. in plain sense about what it's saying? He created us to fellowship with us. Right. Amen. We want to put all the emphasis about fellowshipping with him. That's right, but he wants to fellowship with us. Amen. You know what Brother Brown said? He come down in the cool of the evening. They're in the garden. That's right. And he said, children, yep. have you had a good day today? Have you enjoyed this day in the garden? He said he put them to sleep at night. He said he was pleased. Amen. That's right. He was pleased. He was happy. Well, because he had something in his own image. Right. He had something he could fellowship with. And see, I'm trying to compare it now. See? Because he couldn't fellowship with the animal kingdom because they were not like him. They were a whole lot better than you and I, but they still wouldn't like him. See? And why can't you believe God is real? Because he made you and I real. Amen. And he made us to fellowship with us. He made us a triune being. So I did it. We were in his image. He was a triune being. See, as I said, now our mind goes, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. No. If we're a triune being, body, spirit, and soul, he was a triune being, body, spirit, and soul. It took a quite a while to bring it into being. That's right. 
that he could manifest himself. But you know what? The biggest portion of his manifestation of himself was brought into being after we fell. Right, right, amen. amen. Mm-hmm. It'd be easy to understand how he could come down, as I said, in the garden with Adam and Eve, and there was no sin. There was no problem. Right. But yet the biggest portion of his downward descent toward bringing into being upon what we call time and earth has taken place after the fall of mankind. Right. So don't you think he might still be pleased to dwell? Now we want our children to do good, don't we? You know? We want our children to be good and to do good and we're happy about them doing and things. But now just because that they're not exactly the way that we like them, do we quit fellowshipping with them? <laughs> no, it's been a proven fact all right. that the meanest kid in the family gets all of the benefits. Mm-hmm. Right? You can argue with that if you want to, but it's true. Right. You take one of the kids in the family, they got maybe four kids and maybe four boys, you know, and three of them's pretty good guys and they went out and they're doing all right and one of them's sorry, slot and mud wouldn't work for nothing. Well, who does mom and daddy take care of? Right? Just trying to make a point. I ain't saying that we come into the world to become sinners and make God happy. Now, don't get misunderstand me. I'm trying to illustrate. But even in the fallen condition, God still wants to come down and fellowship with you and I. Right. Yeah. That's where it's always been. Yep. Why? Because we're created in His image. So then if we're a triune being, why can't we believe He's a triune being? Right. When this is over with, are we going up to heaven, you know, and we're going to get up there and there's going to be a little pillar of fire over here. That's the Father. There's going to be a little dove over here. That's the Holy Ghost. And No. I thought the Bible said that we would be like Him. You know. And I thought the prophet said that when we get there, we'll see Him. It won't be just floating around clouds and pillars of fire. That's right. It'll be real. It seemingly to me has been the hardest thing to try to preach one God in the correct order that's ever been on this one basis. It's to try to get people to see what I believe that God is real. When you talk about Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you can bring it all the way down to the Bible. You can do it all. That's, that's all great and well and good. But do you believe God is real? That's right. Amen. <laughs> or is He just the thoughts of your mind? Because if He's just a spirit or something. Mm-hmm. Now, if, if we are real and He's not real, well, which one is the best? Or which, you know. We would be greater than him. Right. But he wanted man to live on the earth and rule the earth. Right. And now listen, you can argue the point, do all you want to, but man was made to put in the garden to till the soil. Yep. That's, right. That's before the fall. Right. See, we want to make it after the fall that he had to do it. No, after the fall is the sweat of your brow. Right. right. In other words, it become hard to do. Right. Amen. But man was put here to till the soil. Yep. To take care of the garden. Yep. Absolutely. Hmm? Sure. Amen. To work some. Yep. Amen. As Maynard G. Krebs said, work! <laughs> <laughs> That's the word we don't like. <laughs> But what's the problem with work? 
You know, what's the trouble with it? Sorry, laziness. That's what the trouble with it. But now listen. I'm trying to just get a plain little point to you about something that, that the Lord began to deal with me about it because He has for years about this and you know I've preached on it. And I believe God is real. I don't believe He's just some floating around something that you can't, you know, find Him and, you know, you just... Uh-uh. I believe He's real. I believe He's more real than we are. Well, now, Brother Dale, is he 16 elements? Well, his body comes from 16 Amen. elements. That's right. Amen. Okay. But I believe his theophany soul being of his person was more real than, than what we're talking about here. Yes. Amen. Because if we believe he brought us here, why can't we believe the one great is greater that brought us here than what we are? Right. Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. But you see, then you get into the, the message of the hour and, and people, they have troubles understanding body, spirit, and soul. And they think, well, that your your soul, will, well, it's just the nature of your spirit. Well, now you're not making it real. You're making it just something you think. Just the nature. Just a thought. But see, you're real. Right. Amen. That's right. Now it's easy to look at the body and see that it's pretty real. Mm -hmm. But you know what? We get so tied up into that until we think that's the real thing. Mm -hmm. Now inside of you is something greater than you are because this body can't figure out how to make no no airplane different or a car different. Right. This body ain't nothing but just moving it, just you know, moving muscles and things. It doesn't have any thinking ability. Right. It can't figure out things. It's no different than an animal. Right. And if you leave him with just the spirit part of him, you're no different than any animal there is. Amen. And there was a doctrine many, many, many years ago before I heard of the message I ran into it that man didn't have a soul till the law came. Oh my. Well, I mean, I heard the man sit there and teach it there at Doraville. And I just asked him one simple question. I said, well, you know, I, I thought that the Bible said that God breathed into the nostrils of Adam and he'd become a living soul. Right. Right. He said, I never thought of that. <laughs> I said, well, you know, and I... I didn't know nothing, but I did try to believe the Word. Right. But see, is your God real? Right. Or are you more real than your God is? Right. <laughs> Which way is it? Hmm? But see, then we get into the intellectualism of the mind, as we call it. Well, you know that brain of your intellectualism and all like that's your spiritual part of you, whatever you want to call it, memory, reason, conscious, affection. You know that, that that's no different than an animal unless there's something controlling it. Right. Right? Just the highest form of animal. So when he created man, he made man in his image. Now, can I quote Brother Branham? He made your body in the image of the animal. A hand like a chimpanzee, a foot like a bear, etc. So he created our bodies in the image of animal life. So what was the real part that was created in the image of God? Be the soul of mankind. See, then we make it this soul as well, it's just a nature. Now you're bringing it down to something that you're not letting it be real. And you're saying the same thing we used to say. Well, God is just a spirit. Well, what do you mean, Brother Dale? He's real. He's just a spirit. Well, you better remember one thing. If He is just a spirit, that spirit is more real than you are because that spirit brought you here. Right, right. 
But see, we want to just do it that way. So what is man? So when he created man, he made him in his image. Right. So the real soul of you is what the image of God is, right? Right. Amen. What is your soul? Well, it's just some kind of nature you got in you. Well, then the dogs that away because you got dogs that are that are, are they're naturally born, and you don't have to train them to be a bird dog. Yeah. Right? They'll go out and bring a bird dog. Yep. Right. Yeah. Because it's a nature that's born within them. Yeah. But see, in mankind, we have to be trained. You take a little puppy dog, you know, down it just gets working walk, you know, two weeks old or something, maybe, or a month old, whatever, just a little puppy dog. And you set it out on the edge of a table. And you know what? It'll sit there and whine. And look off. Right? But you put a baby out there that can crawl. It'll crawl off and fall. So which one's smarter? The the nature is still there of each one because they're natural. But there's something about that baby then that you give that baby a little while to grow up and something begins to motivate within it and to come out into a controlling factor until it not only will not fall off the table, it can make a table. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the real you. Yeah. The real you. Now, but you're a triune being, a body, spirit, and a soul. And here's where in the message do people go wrong then. But when I come to this, I must explain one thing that the Lord showed me many years ago, and I thank God for it. Basically, up until 1962 on the message called The Greatest Battle Ever Fought, I said basically now because you get my point in a minute and you'll see. Basically, up until that point, Brother Brown would cover a human being as being body, soul, and spirit. That's the way he would describe you. Body, soul, and spirit. Huh? But then after the, the Word began to be revealed to him, and right after you go to the greatest battle ever fought, you watch him, he's just going like this. He just seemingly having a problem with his battle in, in understanding. But then after then you watch him and he always teach then what? Body, spirit, and soul. The, in the beginning he would put the spirit as the center realm. Now you study the message. i got two quotes laying here in front of me if you want them. One of them on the inside in 1962. See? 119 that he called his body, soul, and spirit. And then on the rapture message in 1965, he covers his body, spirit, and soul. Now those just two that's brought to you. See, that's where people go wrong with understanding the Bible and then they don't understand their own selves. See, then we go over to a, what is it, a, is it Ezekiel? Where it's, I give you a new heart and a new spirit? Yep. 36. Yep. And see, I'm glad Brother Random explained that. Right. Amen. He said, see, there I said, give you a new heart and a new spirit. He said, you couldn't, under, you couldn't even fellowship with your own self, with your old spirit. Yep. He said, that's not the Holy Spirit. Right, man. He said, because he gave you a new heart and a new spirit. He said, that's not the Holy Spirit. Right. He said, then he went on to say, and I put my spirit in you. He said, that's the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's right. Yep. But yet even in the time that he was quoting those scriptures and giving the understanding, he had it to the basis that the spirit was the center realm of you. Right. And the soul was the second realm. He said, well, I've never heard Brother Brown explain he is wrong. He wouldn't. He wasn't wrong. He didn't have to explain it because he never changed the senses. 
No matter what he called it, body, we can always go with what C.T. Smell smell in here. The second realm of man, whether he called it spirit or whether he called it soul, he would give the second realm of man memory, reason, conscience, etc., whatever those five senses. And the center of man would always be one sense. Neither faith or doubt. It's not faith and doubt. They had it on that drawing back there and I erased it and put on our faith or doubt that I've got in my office. But it's not faith and doubt. Right. It's faith or doubt. Do right. right. you get the point of what I'm saying? Yeah. See, then the prophet didn't have to come back and say, well, look, I was wrong explaining this about the soul and the spirit. Why? Because he always had his senses correct. Right. So just go when you're trying to study what you're talking about. Go and see what the sense is he's saying. Right. And if he says so, and he says, and people will tell you, see there, see there, we get a new soul. Because that's a quote, you know. People say, we get a, we get a new soul. So there the prophet said it. We'll go back and see what he's talking about. Right. He's talking about the second realm. Right. Go check your senses. Just read a little bit. You remember how I expressed it to you over and over and over all these years where the brother run said our language is so messed up with about the board, you know? Right. Come on board, pay your board because I'm bored with you. You know. But all you got to do is just explain what you're talking about each time you know what the man's talking about. Come on board. Stand on that board and pay your board because I'm bored with you. Now you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you don't express it, so what is it? The before and the after is always the answer. So go back and study the prophet's message. When he says you get a new soul, watch him and he'll cover it in a minute that they sense as he's talking about. Right. See that you'd be surprised what that that's cost me in fellowship with a lot of people, but it's as plain as it can be. But it's plain to me that that's the way it is because he never changed them senses. Right. So whether he calls it soul or spirit, do it. And see, that's where your two soul people came in. That's where your uh, your people that believe you get a new soul, you, you, you're coming down with the, the different ones. They use those quotes. It's just like the man about the seven thunder virtues. Brother Branham didn't know what the thunders were until the seals broke. He said he didn't. And he said the thunder was a voice when the seal broke. And then they'll turn around and take a, a 61 or a 60 quote out of the church age book of thousands of little voices thundering out. Right. said, see, there they got them thunders. Laying out the thunders because the prophet didn't even know what the thunders were. But you see, that's always seemed to have been my lot, maybe, if you want to call anything that somebody's in the world for. Maybe mine has been to take all of those things where the contradictory look like statements come from and bring them down to a simple thing just like what we've been through in predestination where I always was eternal. The prophet said, if you have eternal life. Right. That's it. Now the before and after explained it, didn't it? Right. If you have eternal life, you always was eternal. Because mm -hmm. it's eternal life. Right. Mm -hmm. right. See, I like it like that. To me, that's what I'm saying this morning. With the restoration of the Word. With the restoration of the revealed Word comes the restoration of power. Alright. You say, well, I, I, I just don't see it. I just don't see the power now. Well, what are you looking for? Where's it at in you? Yeah. Why are you judging my, my apples by your one rotten one? Mm. Mm. But listen. See, then if we get it correctly to understand that you are a triune being, whether you want to say body, spirit, and soul, or body, soul, and spirit, as long as you know what you're talking about, right. you can see that you're a triune being. Mm. You're not a trinity, you're a triune being. 
exactly in the image of Almighty God. And like I said, it took a long time to bring down things into order of God to bring it down to where you could see that God was real. He appeared in the Old Testament as Melchizedek. Right? But mankind's never been able to understand that one. The prophet of God said, we no longer see Melchizedek. He said, because Melchizedek became Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. Now I told you back a month ago, I guess, was that we get down to it eventually, and I won't finish the day on it, but you don't find the soul being dealt with. Now I didn't say you didn't find the soul, the word soul in the Old Testament. I happened to look that up. There's 399 times the word soul is used in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, it's used more in the Old Testament than it is in the New. The word soul. So I didn't say now that you can't find a soul in the Old Testament. You can't find a man in the Old Testament that understood a soul. Even David said, my soul thirsts after thee, O God. But he didn't have the new birth. The soul of man has always been a problem for mankind to understand. Because if we don't make it real, what are we? It's just some kind of a nature we got. Then the anointing can fall on you. Now anointed ones have the anointing on their spirit, right? All right. But you know, anointed ones, the anointing's genuine. Right, right. Now what they do wrong is not the anointing. Right. Right? right. right. They go out and live like the devil. It's not the anointing that makes them live like the devil. Right. The anointing is the good part about them. Right. But you see, they don't understand the real part. That's why. You say, well, well, all it is is just to understand, well, how come people don't understand anointed one? Right. I'm talking about me and you. Do you really understand how the anointing can be on you and anoint you to do exactly right? And you still be lost? The anointing can be on you to get you to come to church, to cry, to pray, to worship God. Amen. And you still be lost. Well, we better quit dealing with something in a spiritual realm that we don't know what we're talking about, you know, that we can't get straight. Well, Brother Dale, I, I, I know I got the Holy Ghost, but I love the Bible. I loved it when I was in the Baptist. Well, I know I'm right because I know I got the Holy Ghost because I come in the message. Well, the devil's got it on you because he beats you here. Right? right? But you see, we'll never be able to conquer death. And somebody's got to face this thing right. and walk straight through death. Right. And we'll never be able to do that until we understand who we are. Right. And what we're doing here. Right. God created you and me for a purpose. Amen. That's right. He's got something for you to do. Amen. It's not all in the preacher's hand. That's what the prophet said they done. He said they took it off of the laity back there and put it on the preacher. Let him do my praying. Let him do my doing. Let him tell me what God wants me to know. He said, that's wrong. I like to preach to a group of people that knows what, what the message is. Right. Yeah, that's right. And I know a man that used to in this message was claimed to be a big guy. He told Brother Moat one day, he said, you don't want to give them people all them books and tastes. He said, because they'll wind up knowing as much as you do. Oh, my. Brother Moat said, I want them to know what I know. That's what I want you to know. That's right. You're not having to study for a message. You can read anywhere God leads you to lead. Read from, you know. You can just pick up books and study them. I'm reading for a message. 
I'm trying to find the mind of God for what to preach on. And I want you to know. See, when I say triune being, you say, triune being. I say, we're a triune being. What are we? And everybody say, body, spirit, and soul. Yep. Well, see, I don't have to explain all of that. Yeah. Now I say, we're created in the image of God. And even in our fallen estate, and then you know the prophet said that. I give you the quotes when I think that there's a situation there that you're going to maybe not understand what I'm doing. But see, I can preach without notes. You know, or quotes either one. Because I get the thought, and the thought was to me, what is man? Sitting there praying, Lord, where do I go next? What do I say? He said, what is man? Amen. Okay. What is man? <coughs> man is a triune being created in the image of Almighty God. Right. And even in a fallen estate, God still wants to come down and fellowship with us. Not our sin, no. With, with us as beings. Because he's real and he knows we're real. And just like I said, then I can, can say, well now Brother Brown said body, spirit, and soul. And then he say, body, soul, and spirit. You say, amen. We understand. We understand that he just didn't change the senses. So he didn't have to go back and re preach the message over again. He had it right. The senses were always right. So just read the senses and see what it is. If he says soul and he talks something about imagination and memory, you know what he's talking about. Alright? But see then, us being what we are, of body, spirit, and soul, and the real person of you is the inner part. The inner part of you, the soul, the center part of you is more real than your body and spirit. Because that's the center part of you. It's just like it was in the Old Testament when they had what? The outer court. The inner court. But then they had the Holy of Holies. Well, which one do you want to live in? If you want to live in the presence of God, you wanted to go behind the veil, right? To the inner veil, the inner court. Yep. To the Holy of Holies. Because right. that's where God was at. But see, back there to show that it, that it wasn't in its right place to come forth, to even be able to understand body, spirit, and soul, right. only the high priest could go behind there. Right. Amen. But you know what I love about it? Until that was dedicated and set to the place. Now, I, I watch this and I listen. I never, never hear preachers wanting to bring this out. But until that was set in place, until the dedication of the temple, you know that Moses could walk behind there. You know that Joshua could go behind there to make sure everything was made right. You ever thought about it? Somebody made it right behind there. Somebody built it the way it was supposed to be. Right. Somebody put them cherubims over the ark. Somebody put the ark in there. But once it was dedicated, see church, listen, once it would come into being in the Lord Jesus Christ upon the earth, do we able to be able to see what is man? That's right. Man is Almighty God. But it couldn't happen in the Old Testament because once they dedicated that, Moses couldn't go behind there. Right. The only one who could go there was the high priest. Right. Yeah. And he had to be dedicated just right. Everything had to be perfect or he died. Right. Right. And they carried that around through the wilderness for 400 years and nobody didn't know what was behind there except the high priest. 
But I wonder how many sermons that old high priest come out and preach after seeing what he saw. Right. Yeah. He come out there trying to describe what was back there. Yeah. He said, you ain't never seen nothing like it. He said, you ain't never seen nothing like it. He said, did this glow in there, this holy glow? He said, you don't have to light no, no candles. You don't have to have nothing. He said, it's just beautiful behind there. They said, well, draw it out here. And he draws it out and he puts the cherubim and he, he puts the ark and he puts the, the two tables of stone, you know, what Moses put in there and he draws it out and the guy looks at Don't look too glorious to me. All it is is a bunch of junk. But to that high priest, while he was in that presence, yep. he could prove that it wasn't junk either. You know what he got that nobody else didn't get? Every new high priest who was dedicated got a chance to eat a piece of that manna. Yep. That manna that was in the wilderness that everybody could eat, but one day it stopped, didn't it? But you know what? They took a bunch of it and put it in the, the container. And they carried it in behind there and Moses set it down. And you know it never got old. <coughs> And that high priest, he could get a piece of that and he could come out. He said, but I've tasted it. Yep. Amen. But to anybody else, it's just, no, well, it's just a church bill made over this way. And I don't understand that because God told me not to make no images. And there he is, he told us to make them. Mm -hmm. That's the way the carnality of human mind is, right? Yeah, right. <clears throat> but you see, it's the outer court, the inner court, the Holy of Holies. Which is the most important then? A Gentile was allowed into the outer section of the outer court, but you know that he couldn't go into the inner court. Could only be one dedicated for the job. Right. Then the high priest was the only one who could go behind the veil. See, so which one is the most important? The outer court, the inner court, or the Holy of Holies? Which one's the most important about you? Your body? Your spirit? And Brother Brown even explained it. He said, You don't love your soul. He said, you love with your spirit. That's right. Yes. Because yep. your soul is either love or, or Satan. It's either God or it's either faith or doubt. It's either right. one, one of the right. two. Right. It's not no mixture in there. Right. But now get the point now. I'm getting slow. Yeah. So the real person you are is the inner being of you that is called a soul. Yep. <coughs> the real you. The inner being is called a soul. You say, oh, but Brother Dale, it's just the nature of some spirit. See, there's word. You see what the devil's done with that? He's blinded the eyes of the people yeah. until they can't see. That's right. All they can see is just, well, the priest told me it was just, it's just, this, 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 to the point that they just look at it and say, well, it's just, a, it's all just the nature of a spirit. It's just, you know, it's just some nature. No, it's the real you. Amen. Amen. That's right. We read and preached just a few weeks ago about what? That in Ezekiel 18.4, we read that. All souls are mine. But did you remember what the last of it said? And he says it again in Ezekiel 18.20. He says it in 18.4 and he says it again in 18.20. He says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Right. Now the real part of you is your soul. Because right. that's what you are. Right. A being, a person. Yep. There's the image of God more than your natural because your body's in the image of the animal. Right. And that soul inside of you is that in that image of that one that was behind the veil. Right? See? So the soul that sinneth it shall die. It doesn't say in the Bible that the spirit that sinneth it shall die. Right. It says the soul that sinneth. Right. Like I said, it took Brother Branham 30 something years for the opening of the word to get to him 
of Hebrews uh, 44 12 that it's the dividing of the soul and spirit and joint and marrow and all right. and it took all of that time for it to get to the prophet that he would bring it and place it in the last part of his years especially the last say three part three years of his life he would explain it as body spirit and soul and it took him 30 something years to get to there to explain that but yeah we know all about it do we even know what a man is like I said what is death we go up we look in the, in the casket and we say oh look at them they're dead you're not looking at the person. Right. You're yeah, looking right. at the body they used to inhabit. Right. Yep. Right, the person is done gone. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But you see, that's why in Revelation 20 and 6, mm -hmm. and you got it in the church ages and all like that, where it's talking of what? You won't be hurt by the second death. Yep. Now what is the second death? You'll have part in the first resurrection over which the second death will have no part. What is the second death? Now your prophet said on the message, Smyrna Church Age, 1960, 1206, that the second death is the death of the soul. See, now there's even back before the opening that he knew what it was. Why? Because he knew what the scripture says. Read the, read the quote. He would know when he said soul, he would know that it says the soul that sinneth it shall die. Yep. Mm -hmm. But do we understand? Mm -hmm. Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 10 and 28. He said, don't fear him that can destroy the body, but said, fear him that can destroy the soul and body. Amen. Listen. He said, in hell. Go read it. Then go over to Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 4 and 5. Almost the same quote, but he says he'll cast that soul into hell, in other words. What is the second death? The death of the soul. Right. What's going to be the last thing destroyed? The real you. Now, listen to what I'm saying. Your body is going to be in the ground, right? right. So that's not the real you. That's already burned up. Rotten out and gone. Right. So you can say, well, the Bible says the Spirit goes back to God who gave it. All right, but be careful. Don't bring back an ungodly thing and join it back to God. It's just a statement of showing what it does. It's released from the body. It's released. It's gone. And you can't take it back to God. The one that really goes back to God who gave it is the new forming in your new birth in you. Because that's the change of the body and spirit because that's what we need. We need a change of the spirit, let alone a change of the body. Then it can go back to God who gave it. Alright? See, my real point then, what? Is we need to understand the soul. That's why the animal life, see, it, it had no soul. It could be used of God to cover our sins through the blood of the animal, but it had no life within it that could come back upon the human being. Right. God did not have a soul. Right. See? God permitted a man to be born because of the fall in a perverted world, and He, he gave him a, a body, you know, allowed it to come, and a spirit and a soul. The soul is the real you. Right. So the animal, even though it can adapt, it still can't reason things out. Amen. Well, because it doesn't have a soul. See, the soul is what you are. The real part of you is that soul that is created in the image of God. Right. Now that's why it's got to be recreated in the new birth to bring about Genesis 1, 26 and 27 into the right condition, right? right. Because of fitting back there. We'll get to that later. But just think about it. Look how we've advanced. Look how great the, the soul of mankind is that he can lead the animals. He has control of those things. But yet, 
someone came to die. Right. And he gave his own life as a ransom. Right, right. Now it's easy to talk about the River Jordan and all of it. Well, then you've got to admit that Brother Brown said the anointing left Jesus in the garden. The anointing that came on him on the River Jordan left him in the garden. That's a quote from your prophet. So where is your new birth? Of course, you're so spiritual you don't need one. You know all about the quotes that he always was eternal. But then why did Jesus have to die then? Why wasn't it sufficient what left him in the garden to be able to come back upon us to give us understanding? Why would that not be your new birth? But that anointing left him in the garden. Your prophet said he said the spirit left him in the garden. Now you know if it would have been his natural spirit, he'd been dead right there. That's right. So it was the anointing that came on him on the River Jordan. It left him. But he cried out on the cross. Into thy hands I come in my spirit. That soul was ripped out of that body to pay the price. Because it takes a soul to pay a price. Body to body is one thing. Spirit to spirit is another thing. But that only deals with anointed ones. Spirit to spirit. But soul to soul we can become the very offspring of Almighty God. We can become the children of God. See he came to, to, to bring man back to the place to restore fellowship. He came to bring us to that place. God wants to restore man to his rightful place. And man in his rightful place is what? Body, spirit, and soul falling after Almighty God. To understand then why it would be like it is. Brother Brown says your brain is not your intelligence. He said Satan in the garden took man's brain. He said but God took man's heart. What is the soul of man? The heart of man. Not the thumping gizzard. You know, the thing that beats the blood, the heart, that's not your soul, that's not your that's not the, the center of you. The center of you is that life. Right. That reality. Amen. So the soul is the real you. And thereby then, if you do die, now I'm just going to say this and leave it because it's the end of the message. See, if you do die, you got a place to go. Right. But it's one or two. Right. You've, you've got a celestial body. Yep. You say, celestial, good, that's going up. Now, Brother Brown covers celestial going down, too. Yep. He says, according to which one you're pulling from. Right. Yep. If you're born again, the pull is going upward. He said, if you're not, it's going downward. Yep. All right. So you have a place to go to. A sinner, when he dies, he has a place to go to. His soul goes where? The fifth dimension. Right. The sinner dead. And waits there to be brought back into his natural body to stand at the judgment. To be judged. You see, the born again Christian, he has an upward pull. See? So you see then if the new birth is just the anointing of the Spirit, look where it would put you. The new birth is not just the anointing of the Spirit. It's the birth of the soul. Amen. Is eternal life right. through Jesus Christ. Amen. So do you understand who you are? What is man? He's a body, spirit, and soul. Created in the image of his maker. And even in the fallen estate, God thought so much of us that he come down and died for us. Amen. Come on, brother. Think on these things. What is man? He's controller of the earth. Right. He's ruler of the universe. He travels through space like it's not even anything there. And if you ever think about how technical all of this stuff is, you know that before they ever sent one of those rockets into space, they had to calculate. Every moving element in space that they could find and calculate where they would be when that rocket would get there. Because if it didn't, it would destroy it. And in doing that, you know what they found? That they was in their calendar systems and all. 
They found there was a day missing. You've read the story. There was a day missing. Now all their calendar system just one day off. You know what they done? They went back to the Bible. They said, "Was anybody know any place? You know anything we can find this day?" And this man said, "Yeah, it's in the Bible." And they read it. Yep. Said the sun there, Joshua stood still. But to catch what it said about a day, because you know what they done? It don't ask me how they done it, but they done it because they could prove it. They run it back and they said, "You're missing about 20 minutes right. in your space of time." Right. The man looked at it and he said, well, it does say about a day. So then he went back over and he said, well, is there another? He said, yeah. Yes, sir. When the man come up to the time that he was going to die, you know, yes. and God told him, no, it'll be all right. I'll give you 15 years, you know. He said, well, for it to go forward is easy, but said, turn it back, the yeah, dial. Right. He turned it back so many degrees and that was exactly the 20 minutes. That man could prove the Bible is right. Yeah. Had you read the Bible to start with, they wouldn't have no trouble, would they? Right. Let's see, what are what is man? I look at these little children and I see them, and I want you to be educated, you know, and go to school and to learn. And I look at them and I see them, you know, if time lasted. If time lasted. Our little coal would be maybe a jet airplane, or back then it'd be rockets, you know, time he gets up old enough. Might be a doctor or a scientist. You know why? Because he's a soul. And being a soul, he has thinking abilities. He can reason out things. The animal can't do it. He can turn out to be whatever he wants to be. You can be what you want to. We had a president at one time that couldn't read. But you know he taught himself to read. Reading the Bible. Become president of the United States. Right? To show how easy it was done. And then we just had a man that come up to be president, and you can say all you want to about him. I ain't gonna argue with nobody. But you know, we wound up with a man that is an African descendant to be our president. You say, well, no, he's not. He's from Hawaii, <laughs> but his natural descendants come from somewhere over to there. You know, they're still arguing about whether he is or not. But that's no. I'm just. My point is, you can be what you want to be. You don't have to be a lazy, shiftless bum. I told them that in Jamaica. And it's hard to find a job there, but I said, you don't have to do it. You can get out here and get you something. Boy, they didn't like it. Even the pastor after then, he said, man, you really laid it on. I said, do it, is, it, is it the truth? You don't have to be a lazy, shiftless bum. Give me my money. You owe it to me. No. Like I said this morning, it wouldn't matter to me if I was yellow, green, black, purple, whatever color my skin is, and whatever nationality I come from. I am a child of Almighty God. Amen. I'm a child of Almighty God, and I want to stand up for that. Yes. Amen. And to be what God wants me to be. Yes. Don't ever do like they did with the, who was the guy who stepped down from preaching to run for president. Don't do not do that, folks. There ain't no way. I'm in the highest office there is in the land. I don't care what the president says about it. The House and Senate and all of them, they're under my control. He said, they are? I said, yeah, because that's what the Bible says. They'll bend to my ways. Why? Because my Bible says I'm in charge. Why? Because I'm a soul. Not just an animal. A soul that you can't see other than my manifestation. Amen. Let's stand together. Oh, okay. 104 in the red book. 104 in the red book. Anybody have a need? Take on these things. What is man? Eight flesh. Tis so sweet to 